Paul, I'm wondering, do you watch any, you know, long-running series, like a serialized show, not self-contained episodes, but one of those, you know, long-running shows like Game of Thrones that runs, you know, a continuous arc episode to episode? I used to uh, watch a few of them. I, I watched um, Voltron with the kids, the new Voltron series. I watched My Little Pony quite a bit back in the day. Um, when we were living at my brother's house, we they had some sort of Netflix or something, and so I watched a few like TV series there. But we don't have it right now, so I don't know. Just like does Colin Furs on YouTube count? Uh, I don't know. I've never seen that. But like, um, a couple months ago, my wife got HBO Max. Hmm. And. I was like, all right, well, I've watched everything worthwhile on Netflix and then everything not so worthwhile on Netflix and then a lot of crap that I shouldn't have wasted my time with on Netflix. And eventually <laughs> I just I just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm panning for gold in the shower at this point. Like, there's, right. just, there's just nothing to find here. So HBO Max, and, you know, I've heard good things about this. And, and, of course, I'm watching The Boys on Amazon. That's the one about evil superheroes. Corporate. Yes. Corporate, you know, run superheroes. And that's, that's going all right. But then this one caught my eye. Raised by Wolves. Hmm. And the premise is, the premise is, Earth is basically obliterated by religious war. And there's the religious people, which it makes it a really generic religion rather than like single out one world religion, because that would be not okay. So like religious people are represented by these people that worship Saul. You know, Saul is in the sun. Uh, and, okay. at, and the atheists. And it's this high tech war. And we only see the last bit of it as just the planets falling apart. And then everybody flees the planet just because everything's too blown up. Okay. And and there are kind of two factions. One is this giant arc full of religious people. And the other is this pair of robots with a group of children. This is the atheist faction. Is a pair of, of robots raising this group of children. And, you know, they encounter each other and they, you know, they still, even after blowing up a planet, they can't just, neither one of them is willing to go, okay, well, you believe in, you know, the divine and we don't. That's, you know, just stay off our property and we'll be cool. No, they still want to kill each other. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's almost comic. It's not played for comedy at all. But... That's Meanwhile, the, on the other side of the planet, all the people who learn their lesson are like, "Yeah, we don't go near those guys. They're they're crazy. <laughs> they're crazy." Um, but it still really captured me. It was it felt most like you know uh, a short story is if you want to make a sci-fi movie, don't use a book like Dune. You'll never capture it. Use a short story. Short stories make great movies, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to be able to have a, a small enough piece to chew up. Right. And this, because it's a serialized, you know, it's... I, I don't even know how long it is. I, It's at least 10 hours long. And it feels like a novel. It feels... It, that's what hooked me at first. It felt like I was reading a really good sci-fi novel. A lot of weird ideas. The robots aren't just traditional robots. They've got some weird ideas. They need to ingest food to survive, you know, and they've got their own take on things. They talk about the mission a lot and they work together and the religious people have a lot of it. There's a lot of interesting technology in play and a lot of interesting stories and there's a lot of arcs among all the characters and I was really into it. And then somewhere around like the fourth episode, I'm not going to spoil the end of this, but I am going to spoil the introductory episodes. The somebody, one of the religious people, seems to be hearing from Saul directly. You know, you just hear this voiceover that only this character hears telling them to do something. And you're like, oh, they're crazy. And then somebody else, totally unrelated, seems to be hearing this voice. And then this something miraculous happened. I'm like, whoa, is there some sort of alien presence here? 
that's co-opting the this the religious people and pretending to be their god or is the story just going to come out and say yeah their god's real i don't know this is really weird oh the the atheist people are having some really weird ideas are they getting religion or hearing voices is this one character going crazy that's strange i don't know what oh here's a new creature we haven't seen before i wonder where what what's going on with that oh here's this impossible scenario this machine just happens to still be working even after the whole arc you know was destroyed and all this all these interesting repercussions because of that and i wonder where those are going and the story just keeps piling on all these interesting questions and interesting questions and i'm like okay there must be something big going on to explain all of these really strange things yeah how is it how's it going to tie it all together how, how are they going to weave this into a cohesive pattern right and not just a bunch of rant you know the story starts to feel a little disjointed like where are we going with this like what's the what's the goal of this faction now that they failed at their main thing and what are these people doing now and 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 it feels right. like nobody it, has a direction not like anymore. A, it's not like a star trek series where they encounter all these strange things, but they wrap them up neatly at the end of each episode, and then you can put them on the shelf and move on to the next thing next week. It's like there right. are all these loose threads everywhere. Right, right. It's like chopping the last 10 minutes off of every Trek episode, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see how that gets wrapped up next episode. And then they just start in on a new story. And I'm like, wait, but... And then we get to... The, and I guess I have to spoil at least my problem with the series... Um, which is that, you know, and if you don't want to hear about this, just look at the show notes. It'll have timestamps. Skip ahead a couple minutes. The last two episodes introduced an amazing number of inexplicable, seemingly miraculous things. That, you know, they've been on this planet for all this time and they haven't encountered this new thing. And for some reason they're running so wait, into it now. Like a, an alien planet or are they still on Earth? Yeah. No, no, they're on a totally alien planet. And the planet is really well, like it feels appropriately alien. It doesn't feel like they went to the edge of the 30-mile zone outside of Hollywood and <laughs> shot among those rocks that have been in like a hundred sci-fi movies. Like, I don't know where they shot this thing. I imagine a lot of it was CGI because the landscapes are really alien. Anyway, so... so both went on some sort of interstellar voyage and both ended up on the same planet as the other guys that they hate? That's one of the things I was wondering about. Is that deliberate or is that an accident? You know, is that random chance? I mean, or were there just like 20,000 of these ships and they just went everywhere? Right. I couldn't get the feel for how these people wound up not only at the same planet, but within close enough proximity to each other to encounter each other. Um, I thought that was a little... But it was one of those things that I thought was going to be explained and, and wasn't. Right. So anyway, there's these inexplicable things that happen in the last few episodes. And none of it is... In fact, it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder as you get towards the end. And I realize, holy shit, they just pulled a J.J. Abrams on me. And I fell for it. And this is directed by Ridley Scott, who is, of course, one of the great classic, great sci-fi directors. I mean, back in the day, he started the Alien series, and then recently he ran the Alien series into the ground with Prometheus. But he's, <laughs> he's done a lot of brilliant work, and he's shot a lot of interesting sci-fi, and then ruined it later. But anyway... <laughs> so he's just cutting out the middleman here. Right, and this series was like that whole arc condensed into one season of a TV show. All this cure, like the mystery of this alien. Oh, it's just a bunch of bullshit. Nothing makes sense, and you were wasting your time for thinking about it. And but J.J. Abrams did this with Lost, right? He just piled on question after question after question on the viewers each week, and, and eventually you collapse. Your mind collapses under the weight, and you're just like, I, I guess. I'll never know. I guess I'm not smart enough. It's like, no, no, you're smart enough. There's someone else who's not smart enough. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Mr. Mystery Box. 
didn't have a plan for any of this. My God, I hope nobody hands him something really big and complicated to handle, because that would just be a disaster. Um, because <laughs> he doesn't know how to end <laughs> stories, and he doesn't know how to pull th plot threads together. He just throws crap at the wall, and then just shouts symbolism. Anyway, but it's really interesting and it's engaging, and that's like that's the magic of of what he does. Right, and I felt like, like, do I condemn that? I had a brilliant time with this show for the first like six episodes maybe five episodes, and then I got a little little suspicious when we got to the later episodes, and then the last two, I was like, oh, this has wasted my time. This isn't going, there's not going to be an explanation for any of this. This is just free-form fever dream, make up shit as you go along, none of it's going to be paid off, none of it will ever make sense. And I checked out, and I felt like I'd been had, but I enjoyed those first five hours. So, like, what do you... S and this isn't a case of, like, you know, continuing the alien story is different. You, you know, really Scott continues his alien story in different movies. And you could say, okay, well, he finished the story here, but then they made him make more movies. And he had to just tack on more crap, you know, because there wasn't a plan for movie number six, right? He just yeah yeah back in the he was planning for a complete arc and he was like all right good I did that and they're like oh yeah it's all great do more of it oh uh, okay <laughs> right right but the arc is over more move do more um, but this is a season of a TV show so you, you you have to imagine that they started and they had an ending in mind and their ending was just nowhere. Their ending was, yes, we've been wasting your time for all of this. Nothing's ever going to make sense. And that's one of the great things about The Lord of the Rings is like, yeah, it's long. It's like TV series long, but it's got an arc and it's got an ending. And like you were saying, you can't turn a book into a, a movie, but you might be able to turn a series of books into a series of movies. Right. I felt like I'd been pranked, like I'd been punked by the author. Like, I really resented the time I wasted on this series. Because I don't watch that much TV. I'm kind of really picky. And I, I gave 10 hours to this series, or however many episodes there are. And when I got to the end and I realized it was... And that's the thing I'm here for, is tie it all together. Explain this. And, you know, you can introduce a new mystery if you want me to come back for the second season or I'll come back for the characters, but you know, give me the satisfying conclusion. Uh, I'm all about, you know, the payoff, the follow through. Can you bring this, especially if it's really big and complicated and full of questions, I'm here because I want to see some of that finished. Right. It's, and if it was it's like a series of mysteries, like uh, Twilight Zone, maybe, where you never really know what's going on, but at least you know that that's the shtick, then it wouldn't have been so frustrating. But because it had this right. character arc continu continuity, you're like, okay, there's a, there's a continuous story here because the characters have continuity. And so you're also looking for continuity in the rest of the setting, and it just wasn't there. Right. So I'm curious, did anybody else watch this show and what was your take on it and are you going back for season two when they get around to making that all right so what do you have to show the class this week paul well i've been playing some video games um i played a bit of oxygen not included again uh some more from last week i played some more uh industry or i don't ever know how to pronounce it industry or mind industry or something like that right um, it feel it looks like industry but it's about mining so you want to call it mind industry yeah uh what else i play i played i uh, picked up a new game called stormworks and that was pretty fun it's like a building uh building game i think we talked about it a little bit two weeks ago did we i think so I was uh, I was really impressed with the the level of detail in the in the vehicle building mode where it it has just enough stuff to get you to engage with the systems without having so much stuff that it becomes a hassle. The controls are a little bit uh, it's got this whole control system with like 
programmable microcontrollers and stuff, and it, it gets a little bit right. involved there, but it's not too, too bad, and you can kind of get around it by just hacking things together and, like, having a bunch of manual buttons that you press, which is kind of fun. Right, right. Um, it just had... I didn't realize this, but it had just come out version 1.0 release shortly before I bought it. And so I bought the game, I started playing it, and then there was an update, and when I tried to continue playing the game, I didn't realize it, that it had been updated. Because uh, Steam's just so transparent with that stuff. It's just like, oh, we updated it for you, don't worry about it. We're not going to tell you anything. <laughs> you don't need to think about it. And then you go in and you're like, wait, what? Right. So I reloaded my game and like, I, I couldn't, some of the controls had changed because they moved, like, when you want to go into third person mode, you press tab. But they changed it so that in career mode, you're locked in first person so that you can't just like cheat or whatever by, by going to third person mode. Uh, not that it's, I mean, there is some multiplayer, but it's not like competitive multiplayer where you can look around walls and whatever. I mean, you can't even right. shoot people, so I don't know. Anyway, so they updated that and like, so then the tab button didn't work and I thought it was broken. Um, and then like I went over to my boat, it was all tethered. Like you, you drive up somewhere and you get out of your boat and you come back to your boat and it's got these ropes on it that you can use to tether it to stuff. But I hadn't hooked them up to anything. They were just still hooked to itself. There are these little anchor points on the boat and have some rope between them. Um, so I came back to my boat and instead of being anchored, like from this point to that point, it was anchored like from this point in the opposite direction, all the way around the planet or something. Like, off to infinity. <laughs> and then it came back from infinity on the other end and, like, came back and anchored to the boat. And so, like, I tried to drive it and the boat wouldn't move. It's like, nope, we're not going anywhere. We're, we're tied down to ourself, I guess. So that was just crazy. <laughs> and then I couldn't get any more missions to appear. And then, like, I was driving around and I saw some guys just, like, sitting in the water. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll rescue them. But I, like... I picked him up and took him to the hospital, and they they're just like, "What? We we were fine. We're we're not giving you a reward. We're not going to despawn. We're not going to anything." I was like, "What? What's going on here?" So there was some weird weirdness involved, and I think it was just because the update happened and like broke the save file, and I needed to start over. But right. it was a little bit uh, disconcerting that that they pushed an update without checking to see if it would break your save file, especially since a lot of people have like hundreds of hours in this i imagine i'm like i would had just barely started so it didn't really matter but it was a little bit weird that they did that right and often they just sort of assume that everybody's reading all their update posts and you know you're the one player that just buys the game and starts playing it and you're not there reading their dev blog every week you don't yeah, know what's and, up yeah most of the people there have been playing for a long time i presume um but like yeah i'm not gonna if you want to sell me a game, like I paid money for this, I paid what twenty bucks or whatever. Like I'm Ooh, gonna yeah. assume that you have done your homework and that you're selling me a product, especially when you're like, it's the 1.0 release. Hey, it, it all it's awesome now. And I mean, like it is. It's a really fun game. I really enjoy it. Uh, there are great things about it, but everything that is fun about the game you can see in the trailer and so i'm not going to talk about that because you can just go and watch the trailer and you'll be like oh that looks fun and it will be it like everything in the trailer is true but there's some things not in the trailer like when you're in the editor it'll give you errors sometimes it'll and it'll give you errors on purpose because it'll it'll pop a little thing saying hey you didn't connect this thing or whatever and uh okay. and then you connect it up and sometimes the errors won't go away and so you have to like toggle the error thing on and off a couple times or like save and reload the file to get it, those errors to clear up and it's like just weird stuff like that um the editor also has because the editor is such a large part of the game like half the game is driving your boats around and your airplanes or whatever and then the other half of the game is building them and like you know putting them together and programming them and stuff and it's like it's a very significant part of the game so the editor really is a significant feature of this of this game and it's not great it's not terrible it's very, it's functional, but it's not great. And comparing it to like uh, Oxygen Not Included, for example, in in Stormworks, there are pipes that you can connect to things, but they're just generic pipes. And so like you can connect a pipe to the, the exhaust port on your thing, and then the exhaust will just run through the pipe. And then you can connect it to you know, the the output on, underwater and it'll just pump the exhaust out underwater. Or you could connect the output underwater and have it 
go into your intake for your coolant and it'll just like pump coolant in but they're all the same kind of pipe and so like when you're just looking at a pipe it's not clear what it's supposed to be carrying and like what it's supposed to be doing and that's kind of weird because you never design a system that way or at least i don't think you should and so it's like in in oxygen not included you've got these overlays you can go into like electrical overlay right and you can go into yeah. you know the pipe pipe overlay and air duct overlay and you can run all these pipes and stuff and it's also really easy you don't have to like select the elbow and then like click on the corner and then like select the straight piece of pipe and then like click on each straight piece of pipe and you know it's just drag and drop you just drag the thing and drag it over and it just draws a pipe for you and it does all the elbows and stuff like the fun part of plumbing is not reaching into your big box of parts and figuring out which one you need now. The fun right. part is like, oh, I want to connect this thing to that thing. Boom, I did it. Wow, I feel powerful. There's a powerful editor, right? Like, there's no need to have all these parts and the fiddly stuff. But in Stormworks, it, it is all just fiddly bits, and you got to rotate them the it's, correct way and all that stuff. It's like the receiver of plumbing. It's like, make you do, <laughs> make you do everything manually. Right, even if but it's then not... it doesn't have any way to label these pipes. Like you can change their color and do it yourself, but like it should be easy to just have the pipe know what it's connected to and like just give me some feedback, give me some tools to introspect on what it is I'm building, so that I don't have to do it all myself. Like the editor should be able to keep track of that for me. Um, the copy paste is kind of wonky. There's no way to filter what you're copying and pasting. So you can just like, you can select a whole region, but it's just like a big old square region. And if there's something in there you don't want, well, too bad. It's going to copy and paste it too. Um, it doesn't have uh, any way to to figure out, um, to like highlight a whole, a whole section of connected stuff. Um, there's no way to introspect on like how much power a component uses. It's just like, you need to hook it up to electricity. How much power is it going to use? We don't know. You don't know. No one owns. They're like, there's a lot of stuff that that is clearly there in the game somewhere, but there's no way to look at it from the editor. Um, so like even even engines like now they use they've got a pretty significantly deep engine simulation system. It's got their, your throttle and it's got the engine RPMs and it's got the engine temperature and it's got the pressure for all the coolant and all the fuel and all the exhaust and all that stuff and like it's it, it's a involved simulation but you can't see any of those things it's just like here's a medium engine how much fuel does it use well you'll have to guess because like it depends on oh, certain factors but like yeah. come on even like tell me 100 percent throttle at this rps will use this much fuel like it doesn't and just uh, like, give how me much a number can that i, I can a pipe yeah hey, give me a number that i can use to compare to other engines right yeah it'll yeah. tell you the total power output but it won't tell you any of the other things and like how much fuel can I fit through a pipe? Like when do I need to double up my pipes or, or exhaust? Like how much exhaust piping do I need? Do I need to use two or three exhaust pipes on this thing? Don't know. There's no way to tell. Like it just, you just got to try it, I guess. And you could put sensors, like you can install. It's very cool. You can install all these sensors in. You can put like, like um, pressure sensors on your pipes and like uh, torque sensors on your, your pipes that are carrying mechanical energy because it's also like a drive shaft basically. Um, and like you can hook up all this instrumentation and then you can have all these readouts and you can figure out, oh, okay. And, and like at one point I, I built a test rig and it's just like a big old box that sits in the port and has engines and instruments and stuff on it. And then I would swap out different engines and figure out like the ideal throttle settings and the ideal pressure settings and stuff. And like, it's cool that you can do that, but it also seems like there should be some sort of test bench that you can just get those numbers without like literally building right. a thing and literally jumping on it and literally turning the engine on and then being thrown across the map because the, the engine like <laughs> rams the whole test bench against the wall <laughs> and then like, you know, respawning and going over and building a seat on it and then like strapping yourself into the seat so you don't fly around. And then like it pushes so hard that it dips into the water and then like the engine sticking up out of the water, shooting water up in the air and you're like underwater drowning. And like, come on, like I need a test bench for just testing the engine. I don't want to have to like build this Rube Goldberg contraption. <laughs> you just want to like turn the like SpaceX does that thing where they just take their their engine and they clamp it to the ground and they set it off to see what it does. 
<laughs> make sure it's working exactly. before they put people on top of it. Exactly. So, uh, so the editor is not great. It's its functional was not great. There's no way to do multiple symmetries. Like it's got a symmetry plane where you can be like X symmetry. So when you build on one side, it builds on the other side, and when you paint on one side, it paints on the other side, and that's great. But you can't do X and Y symmetry to build like a tank or something or, or like a big symmetrical right. circle or whatever. Like you can only do symmetry on one thing at a, at a time. Um, and then when you get to gameplay, so like that's the editor half of the game. And then when you're actually playing the game, you know, driving around in your boat or flying your airplane or whatever, um, there's there's no way to talk to the AI. So it's a it's a rescue game. You're supposed to be like the search and rescue guy going out and helping people. You know, their boat starts on fire and they call you and you fly out and put out the fire and take them all to the hospital. Or, you know, they're right. stranded and they run out of fuel. And so you go out there and you pick them up and you take them all to the hospital. There's a lot of taking everyone to the hospital involved, I found. <laughs> right. Um, but, like, so you go out there and then the mission will inform you how many people you need to pick up. So it's like, take these nine casualties to a hospital. And so you drive out there and you're like, all right, you know, here's one guy in the water. And so you pick him up and you put him in your boat. And then there's, like, four guys on deck up in the front. And you pick them up, and then you're like, okay, but there's like four more guys somewhere, and and there's these AI characters, <laughs> nope. and like you meet your quota. You, Screw those guys. <laughs> you, you talk to them, and you're like, hey, uh, no, 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 it's it, it says there's nine, and there are nine, but I can't find them. Like, where are the other four guys? I don't know. And I want to be able to ask the guy, like, hey, where's your buddy? Where's he at? Can you can you point me to him? Like. There's and there's no way to talk to these AI characters, and so I like it's very immersive. It's got great sound design. There's no music going on when you're actually playing the game, so it's just the sound. So it's very atmospheric. There's the sound of the rain and the sound of the wind and the the water lapping against the hull, and so it's like really you get engaged with it. And and I'm like driving out. And I'm like, all right, I'm driving my little speedboat that I designed myself out there, and I'm gonna pull up alongside and engage the docking clamp so I don't float away. And I climb up this ladder and I find these guys and he's like you know one guy's passed out and so i've got to like revi revive him and take him all back to the boat and then i'm like all right then you know i've got to get these guys back quick so that they don't die uh where's the last guy and and like there's right. no way to talk to these guys and so like it totally breaks the immersion because like you would be like all right where's carl like has anyone seen Carl? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, he was, like, sleeping in his bunk over down the hatch. Or, oh, yeah, he fell off the boat. That's a crazy one. It's like, people can be sitting in the water. And if you don't rescue them in time, they'll eventually drown. And so, so like, you walk up to these guys, and they're just standing there. And then maybe they'll wave their arms at you, like, hey, come and get us. It's like, okay, yeah, but, like, where's Carl? And he's like, oh, he fell off the boat. We're not going to tell you. We don't care. Carl's a jerk. <laughs> Rescue these incredibly selfish, irresponsible jerks. Yeah. Um, there's also no way to, like, steal their boat. So, and I tried. You can tow their boat back to your to your dock or whatever. Because it just sits out there. You, you take the people, you rescue them off the boat, you take them back to the hospital. And then their boat's just sitting there. It's like, it was a perfectly good boat. No one's, no one's keeping an eye on it. I'm just going to take it. But no, you can't do that. And and that was kind of like, I don't know. I, I want there to be an option for piracy, right? Like, I want to be able to drive up to guys and be like, hey, uh, I see you've got uh, a problem with your boat there. Uh, why don't you all go uh, with me to the hospital? It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it would be a shame if you were to get not rescued. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, uh, this uh, this boat can go underwater, as it turns out. I've got this this valve right here. It'll sink. Too bad if you were strapped into your seat and you couldn't get out. It's probably more fun in multiplayer, because then you really could do that to your friends. But uh, right. And also, you know, you could have one guy, like, flying the airplane, and the other guy could jump out and, like, parachute in and rescue people. And okay, hang on, I gotta There's a lot this of stuff down. you could do. Do not play <laughs> multiplayer with Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so, and the, the thing that really bugs me about it is the missing potential of, of proc gen. Like, there's just no proc gen in the whole game. And it's got this great lo-fi art style that would make proc gen so easy. 
and it's got this building system where you can build and all the boats that you go and rescue and stuff are built in the same system of little blocks put together so it wouldn't be yeah hard to just design a system that would design boats but every mission has like a boat that's associated with it and it's always the same boat it's the same color like there's nothing that they do to make this a, a varied experience and there's also no proc 10 tools for building vessels so you're like you want to build a vessel and like it wouldn't be hard to have a system where you can say like i want this to have a draft of two meters and to be eight meters long and a two meter beam and go and it'll build you a hull and and then be like all right i want an engine of this size with uh and then you put the fuel tanks in and you say hook everything up and it just bam and hooks everything up like it wouldn't be difficult it's not it's not computationally difficult it's not even difficult to figure out how you would design the system it's just a huge hassle every time you want to do it and like why is the computer not doing this work for me and then of course once you have that right. system then you can have it generate the boats for the vessels as well and then it also wouldn't be difficult to just generate levels like islands and it's in this island system so it does do some rearrangement so there's like main land masses and then islands and stuff and then there's a world seed and that will move the pre-built islands around to different places and i think maybe there's some some proc gen islands or something that they do but it's all it all the ones that you can you can buy like you can go and buy new bases and you know and then operate out of those bases and they have larger hangars and larger ports so you can build larger vessels and things um but you but those are all pre-made too and there's an editor in creative mode but there's no editor in in career mode so it's just like it feels like a this huge missed opportunity where they've got these this powerful engine that could do all these things, but they don't have any of the tools. They haven't built any of the tools right. that would make it a really uh, streamlined experience. And then, of course, the world also isn't proc in, which, again, wouldn't be hard. It's very lo-fi. It's not like they have to seamlessly integrate all the textures and get everything to match up. Uh, they've got, like, rocks and stuff scattered all over the place. You could just say, mountains here, a bunch of rocks, and some here's some hills, and done. Like, it'd be so trivial. But uh, that's not it's not what they're trying to do, apparently, which is fine. I mean, it's important that you have a, a handle on your scope, but it just feel, feels to me like this huge missed opportunity. Right. I get it. So if you're looking for a game that is about building boats and planes and cars and has a decent mechanical simulation system in it and... Uh, but no pirates or... No piracy, no, you can't, well, not yet. You know, and there is uh, a scripting language for the missions that you can design your own missions in Lua. And hopefully they'll extend that system to other things as well, to game modes and to world generation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's just missions right now. And hey, if you're looking uh, to do some programming, they're looking for C++ programmers. Uh, it's on their website, so that's pretty cool. Whoa. C++ programmers. Crazy. Are they also looking for someone to come in and maintain their steam engines? Shoe their horses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, they, apparently, they built the whole thing themselves. It's a, a homebrew engine. Very admirable. <laughs> so, the next two news items are connected. And the first one is bad news. This is the story of 2020 for me. It's like, all right, well, I finally have a co game coming out next month. And then, no, wait, that's delayed to 2020. Well, at least I've got one coming out next month. And then next month comes, oh, that's delayed to 2022. Uh, yeah, so the Mass Effect remaster has been delayed. And the, the reason sounds very plausible. They said it was concerns about the quality of the first game. And this ties into what I said a few weeks ago. There's only so much you can remaster a game made like three generations ago. Like if you add higher res textures to Mass Effect 1, it'll just make it look more empty. It is not right. as detailed. There's a lot of big empty box rooms. Uh, I don't want to say a lot of, but there are places where, and especially driving around the open, not the open world, but the uh, when you're driving around in the Mako, in a lot of worlds, even during the, the story missions, those places look very barren. It's just terrain. 
and does not hold up well today if that's what you know if you want your remaster to look kind of modernish that's going to look awkward and barren and um there's a lot of stuff like that in the first game that is difficult to upgrade without remaking assets or adding new assets right so i'm really Which is disappointed kind of the point I, of a remaster right like right exactly it needs to look somehow newer or more up to date and that's very hard to do with the first game and you'd think that a lot of times it what they do is they have a high res model or something and then they'll bake it into a texture that's on a lower res model and that's how they right. get around the polygon constraints and so you'd be like oh well just take that high res model and just put it straight in the game but that's not usually how it's done it's usually the high the quote high res unquote model is not an actual model it's like a bunch of pieces that they use to bake the texture in it's not a cohesive whole or or there'll be multiple steps where they bake some things in and they'll take other things and bake other things in and so it's it's not like they have this high res model just sitting on the shelf that they can dust off and put in the game engine it's uh the the assets were generated by a by a not straightforward method it's not like they had this high res thing and scanned it in or whatever Right. And there was a thing going on back in the day, that right about the time Mass Effect was made, they did this in Doom 3. You know, you go ahead and make your million polygon zombie, and then we'll make a, you know, 5,000 model out of that with, you know, just a big flat face, but we'll throw, we'll turn that into a bump map texture, the million polygon version, yeah, and then it'll yeah. look like there's a, but like, one, it's very likely Mass Effect did not have those original models. So it's like there's nothing to imp There are no original assets that you can just, like, put into the game. Mm. Um, like, there is no higher res version of these rifles or whatever. And, um, or if it is, it still doesn't look that much better than the original texture now. It still looks horribly antiquated because it's been so long. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I can understand why they're, I'm still disappointed, but I can actually really understand why Mass Effect 1 would be tricky. It was also cut up all weird, like loading screens in the middle of a room. You'd be crossing, there's this one place in the Citadel. It's in the middle of a room. There's actually, a, you, there's three or four exits to this room. It's a major thoroughfare. Like you've got to go through here several times. And there's a cutscene where everybody walks over to the window and has a little conversation very early in the game. So there's a lot going on in this room. And it was just too much to fit in the memory of, you know, Xbox 360 or whatever generation it was. And so, you know, it had to be cut up. And boy, that loading screen sucked. You're just crossing the room. I need to, I realize I need to walk up these stairs. And I'm like, which side of the loading screen is that on? I'm like hugging the wall to make sure I don't bump into this invisible barrier. <laughs> and trigger this stupid load. Because I don't need, I don't need to go all the way across the room. I just want to go down this side hall. So... I can and because the level's probably all cut up like that and it's very weird and awkward, it it might make it a pain in the ass to like remaster. You could it might be so old you have to physically remake the level from scratch. You can't use those old assets. The new Unreal Engine won't handle it. It seems or whatever unlikely that you couldn't like port it somehow. Right, but maybe you need to make you you know you need to stop and make your own homebrew converter. Maybe you know Epic doesn't ship a converter from four Unreal Engine versions ago to modern stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, true. You run it through all the intermediate converters, and it'll come out all weird. Yeah, yeah, and all the mission scripting keys are all messed up, and the volumes are all inverted, and who knows what goes wrong. All right, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. Related to, and, and see, I was planning on replaying that this month. I was really looking forward to that, just playing through the first game, and maybe even 
writing a little bit more about that, or doing a video on the remaster, just... It's been a while since I made a video, and I can always talk about Mass Effect. But, as luck would have it, D'Ambert um, emailed me. And I think this is I think this is a mailbag question. No, it's not. It's just this person emailed me. This is a person that's been... You, you've probably seen them in the comments if you follow the comments. But this person has a suggestion for how you could massively improve Mass Effect 3. And I've read a lot of these hmm. theories, but I really like this one in particular. It was like, all right, the writer wants to play with their Cerberus action figures. Fine, but then don't have the Reapers show up. Just don't do that. Like, instead oh. of, like, my, my suggestions were always, like, get rid of friggin' Cerberus, but it's obvious that's what the writer cared about but the other thing you could do is don't have the reaper show it and now it's a very it's this is i think a three-part series on d'ambert's blog so i will link to it in the show notes um but it's worth a look it's very interesting and d'ambert talks about a lot of the failings and how they could be improved by not having the reapers actually show up and begin fighting so very interesting yeah, that would maintain a lot of the Eldritch Horror elements as well, because if yeah. the monster never comes out of the closet, then you can always wonder, like, what's really in there. I kind of thought it should always end with, like, a standoff where, you know, Shepard has the ability to, like, slam the door, um, but it would somehow cost humanity or the galaxy something, and he would have one last conversation with the Reapers and learn something from them. Um is either the why or, you know, who made just one thing about them and leave them the rest a mystery. But you would, you know, you would get something and you would lose something in the end. That's kind of how I thought it should end. Hmm. Thematic, you know, just what the ending should feel like. The mechanics of it, there's a million different ways you could do that. But I, I kind of felt, and D'Ambert seems to be moving kind of in that direction. So that's interesting. So, worth a read if you still have an itch to read even more about Mass Effect. And I haven't just <laughs> made you sick of it. All right, let's do some mailbags. Paul, you go ahead and take this first one. Dear DieCast, Microsoft is launching xCloud. It seems like a lot of people with money believe in this idea. Thinking back over your previous discussions of streaming gaming, I don't remember much regarding how it competes with consoles. What if the console generation after this one about to land is a $50 box and a $10 a month subscription instead of a $500 box? For the consumer, it removes the sticker shock and the upgrade cycle, and it takes nearly four years to, for it to become more expensive. And for Microsoft, it'll be way more profitable because the servers around all these games are going to be cheaper than all the Xboxes would have been, plus the utilization is higher. You don't have to be have the pretty boxes, and you can use industrial power and cooling solutions. So, what do you think? Is that the end game? And I either screwed up and did not post this person's signature, um, or they did not sign it. I apologize to you, mystery person, uh, who will, by necessity, remain nameless. So, I don't think either one of us is particularly excited about streaming services. Nope. I still, I know th this person's right. It, there are a lot of places that are throwing a lot of money at this idea. And I don't know if they know something. I, I mean, this has failed multiple times now. And people <laughs> still keep, they're like, well, I guess we didn't throw enough money into this hole. This time we're not going to mess around. We're going to throw twice as much money into the hole. And that should solve it. Um, it's but, like you know, inverse World of Warcraft. Like World of Warcraft came on the scene because what is it? Uh, Ever Everfall? No, Ever Quest. Ever Quest was yeah. Ever Quest was big. Daoc Dark Age of Camelot was big, and they're like, wow, that's a market that we can dominate. And this is like the opposite, right? Everyone who's entered this market has completely failed to make any money, and right. and everyone who looks at it is like. Awesome. That's the market we want in on. A giant hole in the ground where you can just shovel money. 
I imagine that it must be the economics that are so appealing for companies. Like, wow, if we could just eliminate the idea of selling you anything at all. If we could sell you <laughs> absolutely nothing. You know, I, I didn't like it when we went to digital games and I stopped. Oh, well, you don't oh, technically own the game, Seamus. It's like, yeah, I know. That's my problem. That's why I hate this. I hated when people would lecture me with that. I'd complain about Steam and they're like, well, you're acting like you should own the game. And I'm like, yes, I should own the game. So it's worked for the last 30 years. <sighs> Buy game, own game. Now we buy game and sort of, they pretend like I own it. And now they want to drop the pretense. Yeah. Buy, just rent game forever. And Yeah. Well, it, it certainly solves the pirating problem. Like, on yes, their it end, does. it solves a lot of problems, right? Like, it's impossible to pirate if the game's not running on your local hardware. Uh, it's impossible to... Uh, to make mods or whatever so you have complete control of the mod scene uh and that's yeah. very attractive because then you can make people you can charge people to have access to that um it makes it really easy to to do updates right you don't have to mess around with like hardware compatibility uh it's really easy to develop for uh you don't have to mess around with different kinds of hardware and different setups and different monitor resolutions or whatever you can offload all that on the server you just have one server type and you have complete control of the hardware so it's really easy to troubleshoot it and develop for it um and then anyone who develops for your platform you've got them completely locked up they can't go anywhere else because you're the only guy who runs that server architecture and so they can't port it to any other system because it's it's like the the xbox or not the xbox the sony um the playstation 3 or whatever their crazy architecture like you it, right. it's that basically where it would be so prohibitive to port it to any other system that it's not worth the trouble. And so you've got the customers all locked up, you've got the developers all locked up, and you've got the games all locked up, and then you can just crank those thumb screws as hard as you want. And what are they going to do? Go somewhere else? They can't. Yeah, this is my big fear. And I, and I don't want... I mean, my internet is pretty good. Um... But it's not perfect. And, you know, that's just little hiccups. Somebody starts, you know, somebody starts streaming a, a HD movie in the other room, and that creates a hiccup that gets me killed in the game. I don't want that. I don't want to have to worry about that. Like, that would be this ever present level of stress for me. Yeah. Oh, it also makes multiplayer super easy because then everyone's on a level playing field as far as hardware is concerned. Yeah, and no cheaters. you don't have any client side. Yeah, you don't have any client side messing around and and uh, you know, hacking the client side. So it, yeah, it it makes it it's like ideal for Fortnite, right? They it, everyone all the all the hardware guys would love it if just everybody played Fortnite all the time because it's a really clear hardware solution and it's uh, paid it's free to access so you can give it to everyone and then everyone pays for cosmetics and stuff and there's a cultural force and there's all these factors right and so they're just looking at like how can we turn everything into Fortnite? that would be awesome it's like well right. not everyone wants to play Fortnite. not every game right. should be Fortnite. right and that's my fear i mean i want to predict since this solves none of my problems and creates many new ones for me this whole system it it shows people playing on their tablets and phones and it's, of course it's all gorgeous attractive people hanging out in gorgeous <laughs> settings playing video games and it's like are you kidding me if I was on a beach I wouldn't be playing friggin Fortnite on my phone what are you talking about get out of here with that like it would the, the real thing should be a very sad businessman sitting on a subway but crowded between two people trying to play you know, a very laggy version of Fortnite and dying over and over because he's lagging so bad. Or Riding not dying over and over because he's playing against bots anyway. Right. Well, that's another thing. It's like, take it with you anyway. The, the commercial was very big on everybody having this wireless experience. And I'm like, wireless increases. Like, they were always like, you know, you got to be plugged in to, 
in Stadia or whatever was the one before Stadia, X Live something, I forget what it was called. The very first one that came and went and died horribly. Yeah, I don't know. Was, it seems like they're they're perennially trying to sell this model. I mean, it's basically an MMO, right? Only for everything. Right. But back in the day, it was always like, you know, be sure you're plugged in directly to the internet. You know, don't use Wi-Fi because that's a few extra milliseconds of delay. And Right. And, and if you turn the microwave on, then your signal goes to crap. <laughs> right. And there's just so much that can go wrong with that. And it shows all these people, like, one woman's, like, hanging out on a roof. I'm like, how good's your Wi-Fi on the roof of your apartment building? Probably <laughs> not awesome. Everybody just well, sitting there love, beside their router. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What they'd love is for all the guys who own super yachts to be like playing this, you know, on the, the back deck of the super yacht with all their supermodel girlfriends and stuff. Like that's their target right. audience. And like maybe, maybe so. But uh, those guys can afford to buy all their own hardware and put it in a server closet in their super yacht. So why would they right. not do that? <laughs> why are they going to play it on a phone? Yeah, I just don't I I just don't see where this market is for the user, but then, you know, I was kind of taken aback by how much people embraced the Steam model when I thought it was just you know, re repulsive to me, not owning a game, needing to be online to get permission to play the game that's on my hard drive. I just oh, that made me so angry and everybody was like, "Yay!" I like not yeah. having to get the disc out. And I'm like, yeah, but principles and like ownership. And everybody's like, yeah, it auto updates for me. And I'm like, all right, well, it's clearly nobody cares about the stuff I care about. So I'm hesitant to predict that this is going to continue to fail. Um, maybe, maybe it'll hit the target market. But who is this target market that is a hardcore is hardcore enough that they want to play AAA games on their phone? But, you know, you can't play unless you're sitting around your own house or near a Wi-Fi router. Where are you playing these games? Your router isn't on the beach. It's not well, on the roof so, of your apartment building. So one of the, the technologies that is coming into maturity is 5G wireless, which does have the bandwidth and the latency to, to do this kind of thing. So if there's widespread adoption of 5G... You could do it without Wi-Fi. Like you could just do it on your on your cell data. Interesting. Uh, but isn't that? I mean, it's it's lower latency now. But what happens when everybody's using that much bandwidth and has that much? Is that fast? Isn't that going to put a strain well, on the five G network? Well, I mean, that's what network? they'd love. They well, yeah, they'd love to do that because then they can afford to build a whole bunch more five G towers everywhere. I see. So it's like, hey, so it's the same. It's the same offer these streaming services are made, making. If enough of you sign up, we'll actually build the hardware to support you. So yeah. that people come on launch day and there's not enough, and they can't log in, and everything's slow and laggy. Yeah. Well, and I suspect that a lot of the the target market for these services is not in the U.S. It's in uh, Tokyo where they have already got 5G because oh, right. the population yeah. density is just super high. It's in uh, major cities in China where they've got super high population density. They're already building a 5G infrastructure. It's in uh, cities in Europe where they've got the, the population density. Anywhere where you've got a really high population density, you can afford to put in one really expensive piece of infrastructure that will serve all the people within the line of sight, basically. And that makes it really uh, affordable. And then you just put a server there, and now your latency is super low. And then you've basically built like a single console server for the whole city. And uh, and then the economies start to make sense. But yeah, I, I totally agree. In the U.S., it, I don't think it's ever going to make sense because the place is just too big. Right, the popular... It's the same reason we don't have a lot of mass transit that Europe has. It's like our population yeah, density exactly. isn't there. <laughs> You can't justify yeah. it. Yeah, so like Singapore is going to love it, and maybe it'll take off. But the the other thing that's that makes me think that this is still crazy is that Google is the like the 
internet infrastructure guys like that's all they do that's their whole deal and they couldn't make it work and so i i'm not convinced that microsoft has a chance if google couldn't do it i i don't know why microsoft thinks they can they hilariously couldn't make it work they humiliatingly couldn't make it work the degree to which they failed to make it work is the stuff of legends yeah and it's they're still I, I don't know about right now, but like I, about a month ago, they're like, hey, you've still got your Stadia account. You can still log back in. It, there's there's a discount on games that you can buy that are only going to be available on this platform and you won't be able to use anywhere else. <laughs> right, this dying platform. Don't you want to buy some more games for our dying platform? Yeah, yikes. So yeah, Google Stadia is dying and then everybody else is rushing to like oh boy i gotta try that there's a saturday night live skit that's this family of like okay somebody goes into the fridge and like oh this smells terrible you know this today they open up some tupperware this smells awful oh really and somebody else oh yeah you're right that is awful oh i gotta smell it. oh that is and so they they pass it they it's sort of like everybody needs to experience the awful thing and i think the skit ends with somebody falling down the stairs and then everybody else throwing themselves down the stairs too right. and that is the perfect metaphor for what we're seeing with this streaming service and maybe maybe one of these companies is gonna land on their feet with it and I'm probably, you know, being a hardcore PC gamer, I like my mods. I like my freedom. I like being able to tinker with things. I like my zero latency. I don't, you know, I like being able to control the hardware and do what I want and capture screenshots whenever I want and, and, and all that stuff. And um, so this this is, you know terrible for me but maybe like you said there is a big um market for it out there although it is funny how hard they're trying to sell it to us americans and i don't think we want it yeah yeah the, the marketing guys have gotten kind of turned upside down i guess and and like you said maybe it'll take off maybe it'll work maybe there's the, the magic bullet somewhere that, that they can solve this uh microsoft does have the best distributed processing systems azure is is the best in the world so maybe they they know how really? to do it and and they've you know they waited for uh for google to clear the ground with stadia and now they're just gonna hop in and and steal their lunch it's possible i don't think it's gonna happen but it's possible i really hope it fails i just hate the <laughs> me too <laughs> because i just don't want to live in a world where i have to rent games forever and oh, that would just break my heart. Yeah. Well, because you know that if it actually does work, then all the best games are going to be developed for that platform because right. it's so much easier for the developers. And so it's going to be so much cheaper to develop the games. And so then the economies work in that favor as well. So like as soon as something really takes off there, it's going to be almost impossible to get high quality games on your PC anymore. Right, and it'll just become the indie platform, which is cool. I mean, I don't mind mid-tier and indie games, but yeah, yeah true. I, just... I don't play anything else anyway, so I mean that it's not a personal concern, but it would be uh, a real coup for Microsoft if they can pull it off. Yeah, and I hate having that, and especially as a critic, I hate having that level of uncertainty. Like, oh, I'm playing through this game, you know, for my retrospective that I'm going to do, and I'm just getting footage. And then all of a sudden you get that, it gets all laggy, and um, the whole screen just JPEGs to hell. And then, right. you know, it all, yeah. it all like heals. You're streaming something. Right. And then it heals, and it goes back to normal. But it's like, I, I needed that footage. That footage was... A, it was a screenshot I'm going to need for a future video, and I can't get it back. Like, oh, you'll be able being... to get it, though. You're, you'll be able to get super high-quality footage because you just pay them to capture it on the server side and then send you the video. <laughs> this is so you can awful. get as high resolution as you want. How, how many frames a second do you want? They'll capture it for you. It's no problem. It's easy. All you have to do is just pay them for it. I hate the future. 
We must stop it, Paul. We have to team up and stop the future. Uh, I, I think we've got some people on that already. It's the beginning of <laughs> November, <true>. right? <laughs> and with that, I think we need to end the show. Oh, I broke it. I broke the diecast. All right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for Paul and I to answer, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Remember, no politics.